everybody, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, or if it's your first time, welcome. Um, we're going to um, launch into a conversation today that's going to be far-ranging with somebody that goes way, way back in my history, probably further back than either of us care to admit at this point, but it's an old friend. Mm-hmm. He's been with me a long time. We have numerous conversations privately and a lot of what we talk about is clearly material for the show, but um, it's been far too long since I've had him on. I think I think we've done a couple interviews since 2000. Oh, shudder. 2013 when we did the 50th anniversary JFK show. But uh, it's been far too long a conversation. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Ev Halford. Well, it's great to be back. You know, I'm... I'm in a different place than I was in uh, 2013, so... It's a different world than it was in 2013, 2015. Mm -hmm. I know, it's a completely different world. And I I hope to talk about that, how this world has changed so much in such a short time. Yeah, you know, and it's a, I, you and I go back to where we originally met was probably 2007... 2005, yeah, maybe, doing shows with Visigoth. Visigoth, yeah. Yeah, the Grassy Knoll and Return to the Grassy Knoll. So I know there's some people out there that listen to this show that are um, basically throwbacks to the days of Visigoth. And um, that's where you and I met and initially began to uh, talk and do interviews. You were, you were originally on my Threshing Floor program, which was my, my Christian... Christian radio broadcasting days, my prophecy days, and that we share in common as well because both of us come from kind of a theological background. So to tell people a little bit about you, Ev, you're a writer, you're a researcher, you have a theological background as well. Um, You have an interesting life in that you have first-person connections to what I will just say is sort of the deep state side of things. In addition to, people can go back, and I'll post some links to this, go back and listen to the the 50th anniversary JFK assassination show because um, Ev talks there about his own personal connections to Kennedy and an event that happened prior to Dallas, but not too prior to Dallas. And where was that that you actually, your father took you to see JFK? The day before he was assassinated, I was uh, four years old, so not far from being five years old, and he took me over there, and I, I have this vivid memory of him holding me in his arms, and uh, me, I'm looking at the limousine that, uh, with Kennedy and Jacqueline, with John Kennedy and Jacqueline, and uh, I think it was uh, the uh, John Connolly in the car, and, and this was before uh, the motorcade in San Antonio, uh, before the next day that he was killed in that same limousine in, uh, in Dallas. And, you know, 
I didn't know uh, until you know just a few years ago that my whole life laid in the shadow of that. That uh, somehow I got involved with the uh, with the white Russians in Dallas and. Uh, my coming to New York was related to uh, to a bishop uh, named uh, Dimitri Royster, who's mentioned in this uh, uh, conspiracy document under the Garrison investigation called the uh, Torbit document or the nomenclature of an assassination cabal. And somehow I circulated in the, in those uh, venues. Uh, of course, you know, I suspected my dad had some kind of a top secret job growing up because he talked about it, you know, periodically. He never told me what he did for a living. But he seemed to be like, you know, almost like a at Zalig, you know, the Woody Allen movie or Forrest Gump. He seemed to be involved, you know, a, a trail in at all of these major events of the last 30 years. Going back to my childhood, actually, I'm 61 years old now. You know, my, uh, you know, I have vivid memories of, uh, of when I was like five years old, shortly after the assassination in 1964, of being in, in the neighborhood with the astronauts' children, you know, Neil Armstrong, during the Gemini program, and going to kindergarten with many of the, you know, of the children of the astronauts. And my dad uh, told me later that he was working at NASA at the time directly under uh, Chris Kraft, you know, he used to joke that he, that was the best job that he ever had because he got to be, he was responsible for taking care of all the physical property at the, at the space center. And, you know, I suspected my whole life that my dad had, you know, had these connections. He would never tell me what he did. He would disappear for long periods of time. And, um, he used to joke with me. I mean, I remember he had these uh, this huge set of keys, you know, with master keys to all different kinds of locks that he carried around with him. And one time I asked him, Dad, what are all these keys about? And he gave me this kind of flippant answer that the keys uh, uh, were because when a man has uh, many, uh, many keys, he has many responsibilities. And you know, somehow during the Iran-Contra era, he was involved with the uh, Defense Mapping Agency, allegedly mapping, mapping Nicaragua at the same time that the Sandinista and the Contras were going on. And there was a trail throughout his life that he was on the periphery of all of these things. And I, as I think I explained that uh, my dad died under very mysterious circumstances back in 1998. He had left the, um, you know, the service, had left the Air Force that he was allegedly working for as his, uh, you know, day job. And he calls me on the phone one night, and I think it was the 15th of September, 1998. That's 22 years ago, a little over 22 years. And he tells me he wants me to come down there to Texas and uh, bring a tape recorder. And my, my kids were small at that point. I have four children, and they were all small. And we were living in a small apartment in uh, in Queens, New York. And we didn't even own a car. I took the train to work every day. And he tells me he wants me to come down there because he's going to spill the beans about everything he knows, all his top secret information. And I didn't have the desire or the wherewithal to go down there. And then. Three days later, I get a call that he has died. Actually, he was in a coma. They had found him in a coma in the apartment in Abilene, Texas, where he was living. And he lingered on in a coma for a week, and they called me. I went down there, and when I got down uh, to Texas, to Abilene, they refused to let me see the body. They, uh, you know, someone told me orders had come down that he, uh, that, uh, I couldn't open the casket. I couldn't see him. And then I buried basically a closed casket with my mother. And to this day, you know, the circumstances under which that happened, you know, linger on with me. And I wonder sometimes, did I really bury my father? So your father predeceased your mother. 
So my mother predeceased my father. My mother died in 1989. Okay. And my father died in 1998. It was nine years later. Okay. So and you see, I didn't know, and now I know about the background of the family, who the Halfords were. You know who their ancestors were, how well connected they were to the founding of the United States, to those original families that came to Jamestown and everything else. I didn't know any of that. I didn't know about my mother's family, how closely related she was to the you know founders of the College of William and Mary. I didn't know any of that. I knew that my parents, because they had told me that my mother was very young, a teenager when she married my father, I think sixteen years old, and that my and they had met at a Freemason temple. In uh, in Texas. Uh huh. Like well, even was, just uh, that College of William and Mary—that's one of the oldest institutions in the United States. I've been there, and that whole area there is just soaked in the, I guess, the vibes of that early early colonial, even probably pre-colonial period. I mean, we're, we're talking <clears throat> literally the first settlements. Uh, by Europeans in the United States. You know, it's funny because, uh, you, you know, there are only about five or six hundred Halfords left in, in, in the entire United States now, and there are various spellings of the name. Some spell it Halford with one L, others spell it um, Alford, A-L-F-O-R-D, but they have dropped the H. The original name was Holford, uh, H-O-L-F-O-R-D, and uh, my direct ancestor came from uh, came on a ship called the Christian in 1635 that landed in Boston Harbor, and then he went to live with his uncle, uh, Reverend Philip Mallory, in uh, in Virginia, in Charles uh, City, uh, not far from Jamestown. And if you trace the lineage of the Halfords, uh, you know, going from uh, his uh, Thomas's mother, who was uh, a Mallory, and this is the Mallory family that were close to Charles the First, and then subsequently, after Cromwell, you know, led his revolution, then he was deposed, and the Puritans first went to the Netherlands and then settled in, in the New World. My family was, uh, my ancestors were there at the beginning of all of that. And and they intermarried a lot of these famous families of history, like the Daltons and the, and the Bats and, and, and the, the Mallorys. You know, the story goes that they were the ones that uh, financed the ships, that, you know, the three ships that came to Jamestown and settled in Jamestown. So by pedigree, uh, my family were connected. You understand? On both sides, both my mother and my father's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the whole thing so sounds like a real bloodline set up right from the beginning. So if you know uh, the way things work in this country, you know, there's a ruling elite, what they will commonly call the deep state. And the deep state consists of many of those, you know, the names you never hear mentioned. You know, they'll tell you Jeff Bezos is the you know, richest person in the country, but the total assets of the United States are in the trillions, in the trillions. And and, and Jeff Bezos has 150, maybe $200 billion now. That's a thousand, uh, one one thousandth of the total assets of the United States. I mean, I, I've read in numerous articles about that, how half of the assets of the United States, half of the $110 trillion total assets of the United States are owned by eight individuals. And we don't know who those people are. And we don't have any idea yeah. you know, who the, 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 you know, those who receive land grants from the British kings for the land in the United States. I mean, you, you think about, you know, most of the land was given. It's like the, you know, Roger Mallory, who was Thomas's first cousin, was given half of the state of Virginia as an inheritance when his, when his uncle Philip died. And these are things, you know, there's no way for me to have known this if, you know, you know, I hadn't come across the fact 
or uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's a family called the Powells. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you... now. I've learned, you know, my ancestors were Powells, by the way. That's one of the another, and, and the Powells are literally the descendants of the kings of Wales. So, and 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 it's not a common name, uh, a Welsh name. It was originally Op A P Howell. His name was Howell or Highwell in the Welsh language. So Op Howell, you know, the son of Howell. It's a lot like the Mac and the Mick in the Scottish language. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. With the son of Hal, and you know, I, you know, I did recently. I did a genealogy back, uh, and showed that you know that the Powells, uh, back at least to the 900s, go back directly to one of the sons of this Welsh king Hal, who, by the way, was called king of the Britons, like Arthur. You know. You know, the, because you know the Anglo-Saxons who came in the three uh, hundreds, a little bit of uh, history, were came to fight against the the Viking raiders, and they ended up taking control basically because they were larger and uh, and more powerful and better soldiers than the smaller Britons, and they ended up ruling England. And you know that 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 uh, order of Anglo-Saxon lords are called Saxon lords in the Robin Hood stories. Uh, in 1066, when William the Conqueror came, and and with his knights divided the spoils, in a book that's called the Domesday or Doomsday Book, uh, you know, shortly after his conquest in 1066, this is part of the history of uh, you know of, of England and everything else, and. There are certain families that have that you know, that were given you know authority and wealth and privilege that many of them those same, those same families still have control. You know, you, know, you mix me. This is where I struggle with this. What so you know. I'm doing a series called The Eye of the Needle, and it is actually, the project itself is kind of an integrative podcast where I'm writing and I'm sort of airing the data as I go along on this. And I've looked back at the research on historical revisionism. And the more I look at it, the more I begin to wonder how much of the official story that we've been told can actually be dated correctly given historical revisionism or that that were here's here's the what ifs and because you're a novelist you understand I'm playing with plot lines too what if these histories were all written to give a pretext to a storyline for these controllers who have basically sliced and diced territories and nations and states and, you know, basically waged bloody mayhem across this this world for, well, what for do, conquest. What they do is, in their divide and conquer, is they create countries and they create borders and they create ethnic identities. And then they use them to pit one person against another so they remain at the top of the pyramid. And literally pyramid, because, you know, pyramid uh, goes back to the, all of the esoteric religions and, uh, you know, the Egyptian religions and everything. Else. You know, it's part of that whole occultic Freemason, you know, tradition, which is, you know, beneath the surface of everything. And, and you know, and I'm not a conspiratorialist in the strictest sense, uh, because, you know, I, I'm not looking for you know, boogeymen under rocks or stuff. But, there, but, you know, you can't look at things that go on and not see the patterns, you know. This is one of the, the, the devices I used in almost all my writing. You have a story that's being told on a, on a surface level, and then you have a deeper story that's, that, that's beneath yeah, all of yeah. And that's really, you know, I think that's where you and I intersect. You know, your books that you've written 
All of them have this woven through them, this thread. This isn't conspiracy theory. This is looking at the world open-eyed and going, the linear narrative doesn't fit the context that I'm observing. Yeah, well, this uh, something my dad told me repeatedly from the time I was a small child. He said, the stories you're being told, either in school or on TV or in the newspapers, you can't believe any of them. You have to be skeptical about what, what you're being told. There's always a deeper story. There's always a deeper truth that's been hidden from you. I have struggled my whole life uh, to try to come up with uh, deeper understandings. And uh, it, it's not easy because almost everything that you're told at the, at the surface level is noise. It's like we're living in a, you know, with one of those uh, virtual reality, you know, headsets on and, and, uh, and we don't know how to take it off so that we can see what we're actually experiencing, what the world really is. And which feeds into you know the, the novels and, that I've been working on and stories I've been working on now, is how do we come to grips with the fact that much of what we're being told every single day isn't true at all? It's just the cover story, like in my book, you know, in my books, it's the story that's beneath the story. You take some modern examples, and you know the common nexus here for you and I obviously goes back to the time we spent in the early 2000s, and especially, you know, w with Visigoth doing what he was doing, because the grassy knoll was basically centered around the backstory of the JFK assassination, which this goes into the narrative that I'm building in the Eye of the Needle series, which is these mass trauma events as resets. And... So you have the JFK assassination, but that then doglegs over many years later into the next grand scale event, which is 2001, the World Trade Center, the bombing of the um, Pentagon, the incredible scenario that played out over the skies in Pennsylvania, and the events that occurred in that day. And I think... You know, even going back to the Kennedy, you know, it was in my teens when I started to hear, and it was my grandfather who was somewhat my mentor, sort of like your father was to you. My grandfather was a pretty high up Mason. He was very connected with the railroads. Um, he was basically a, um, what you would call a henchman of the Harriman family who ran the New York Central Railroad. And he was very well connected politically. Growing up, I met a lot of politicians. There's a picture of my grandfather sitting at a conference table in Washington, D.C. towards the end of World War II with Harry Truman. So I got little cues and prompts along the way as well from my grandfather. And he was the one that said to me that, you know, the JFK shooting was nothing like what was portrayed, and I was literally sitting with him the morning they shot Oswald as a little kid. And, you know, he he sat there and he went, my God, they, they got him. And years later, before he died, I asked him what he meant by that. He said, there was a whole chain of events that went into this. And it piqued what eventually became my curiosity about Kennedy and starting to do the research back before, you know, we really had this um, this conspiratorial field. Now, I don't like the term anymore, but skepticism, like what your father said, you know, let's call ourselves historical skepticists. So, uh, Kennedy assassination, 9-11, but here we are in 2020, and live from March 15th, 2020 forward, We've been in this event called COVID-19 or coronavirus and this enormous campaign, which is literally altering the landscape of the entire world, economically, socially, uh, medically, technologically, everything is being spun in, in, in faster and faster cycles now. And the interesting thing is that now we have the ability to deconstruct with what we know in real time. So we're actually able to look at this event, 
uh, from a from a viewpoint we didn't even have with 9/11 because in 9/11 we didn't have the functional internet, the web that we have now, and you didn't have all of these platforms to share data and information with. Granted, they've been co-opted. So my my point is that. We're, we're now in the midst of an historical event where people who have their eyes open can literally watch as they're doing this entire program, and it is a program. Of course, it's a very detailed, very well planned out program. I mean, they, it was no accident that they, they show us TV programs because they're there to program us. <laughs> yes, that's in, that's entirely true. Yeah. They're there to tell us, and, and, and when you go to school, you know what they tell you? Well, you know, I'm going uh, into this program at the university. I mean, they don't make any, uh, you know, secret out of what they're doing to us. You know, the neuro-linguistic uh, programming, you know, you know, you know, they choose the, the, you know, the, the plastics that, you know, uh, they they elevate the estrogen in our bodies. They, they're they're manipulating the food that we eat. All part of this uh, reprogramming of our, you know, the way our bodies work, and uh, and then they're releasing viruses, allowing them to spread. And 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 a virus alters your physical structure. You know alters your the way your brain is structured you know there are some viruses that can go through the blood brain barrier and i'm you know these are generalizations but uh there's been a program going on for hundreds of years to produce a different kind of human being one that's more submissive one that more obedient, and I think that this whole exercise with this COVID has been an exercise in producing compliance for us to get us to go along with whatever else they've got planned for us after this. <clears throat> and I said, I'm not an alarmist. You know, uh, I've understood from the beginning that our whole lives have been laid out for us. The stories they tell us, the movies they provide for us to watch, the television programs they put on for us to see, the fake stories uh, that they tell us about our own past. It's just amazing if you think about it, how effectively they're able to control a small group of people, a vast number of other people. That are beneath them. And yet at the same time, they can't cordon off truth because humans humans are innately psychic. And you know this mm. because of the books you've written and you understand this on a on a on a very big scale. That there is within the human species certainly people who are profoundly aware of their psychic intuitive skills, their empathic skills. And quite truthfully, some of us were born into this, whether we liked it or not. And for me personally, there are times when I wish I didn't know what I know, that I hadn't experienced what I've experienced. There's a part of me that honestly sometimes almost almost admires the people who can just meander through life and not not deeply deconstruct the reality around them. I, I, I almost I almost sometimes envy them that. But at the same time, it, it's a it's a, it's a program that relies on compliance and yet it has to build compliance into it because of the outliers that are, you know, in the in the wild out there. The the people they can't rope in no matter what they do. And there are people who have been in programs, people who have been called through the educational systems, the religious systems, the financial systems. All of the systems are designed to basically slot, sort, and find both those who are the compliance and those who are the outliers or what we would, you know, we would call the deviants. I mean, in a, in a true sense, we're the deviants in the society because we're the ones that smelled the game real early on. 
And, I know. Um, and it's heartache. I mean, you know, just days when I wake up and I just go, could I just please today not think about this? I know. It's every day for me. You know, I think about, you know, I, I wrote these books, these uh which were basically a parable, a metaphor, uh, you know, um, to try to explain, you know, the history of the last 25 years since I, you know, had my first awakening when I read my first JFK book, you know, conspiracy book. You know, the epiphany for me came when I went to see that JFK film in, in 1991. You know, I had known the stories my father had told me, but when I, I went and saw that movie and I started reading, and, and this is... That was the Oliver movie. Stone film, right? Yeah, the Oliver Stone film. Yeah, JFK. The JFK movie, yeah. And that was the, you know, and I went and I read Mark Lane, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and A Plausible Denial, and... I read, uh, you know, every book that the you know, that the Queen's Public Library had about the Kennedy assassination. And, and then when the internet, uh, you know, uh, began, and when they stopped, when they started having search engines before Google took over, you know, when the when you could actually use one of the InfoSeek or Yahoo in the beginning of Yahoo, and actually get the documents that were in the universities. Before they had, you know, shut everything down. Yeah, that was, well, you had Alta Vista back in those days. There were a half dozen search engines. Yeah. And those search engines, by the way, you know, we're talking the Internet, but we're talking the topology of the web. And people get confused by that because the web is not the Internet. But it mm -hmm. is the Internet now because it was the commercial Internet that was basically Internet 2.0. And those archives, which were online, were the result of basically ARPANET, which had extended itself out into the EDU domains. And ARPANET was basically extended into what was called um, UUNet, which was Unix to Unix networks. And then the Usenet groups and the different mail lists that existed you know, it's funny because today I just found out they have released millions of archives of Usenet going back from 1981 to 1992. I, I'll put a link up with this, but I'm fascinated. I would love to go back through those because I was on those in those days. But in fact, you're correct. You could go get authenticated original documents in that time, including government documents, declassified university publications, very high-level scientific and historical papers. Yeah, and I was at the library with a, you know, a 500-page ream of paper going almost every day in the mid-90s. Mid <laughs> uh, you know, Putting it out on dot matrix printers, eh? And the dot matrix printers and printing off all these documents. Oh, I, man. I don't have good old days. Anymore. Green bar. I don't have them anymore because of you know personal tragedies and a storage room that would, I couldn't pay, and they auction off all of my uh, my treasures. But that's you know uh, tragedies happen to, uh, to everybody, and we all have to deal with them. But. I remember, I remember when you, you could look something up and you could get, uh, now Google basically shut it all down. Even the, you're, you're not going to find any of those things. It's like if you try, you know, if I try to find anything about, you know, there, there was a time that the, uh, you know, in Wikipedia would have articles and they don't exist anymore. You know, they take them down. Right now, the you know the, the Facebook and Twitter and all of these conglomerates, which are controlled ironically by some of the uh, the same families that have been in power since the Kennedy assassination and some even before. I mean, I'll be, you know, I don't know how much you want to go into the Gates family or others, you know, their history or how, how it is that all of these people with intelligence connections ended up, you know, being the ones that came... Uh, into the uh, you know, they now run all of the the, the services, uh, like the like you know, it, 
people from the NSA that created uh, Google and various other things. No, well, you know, the, take the Gates family. I mean, they go the yeah. whole way back to the 1800s that you can... So this is an old family. This is what you would call um, East Coast establishment, mainline type families. And Gates' grandfather was a henchman for the Rockefellers. He was responsible for, we'll call it security, for lack of a better word. He was responsible for the security of the oil fields in the United States run by the Rockefeller family and in putting down what was basically some of the early um, strikes that occurred to, as, in, leading up to organized labor, basically. This was pre-Union, pre-John Lewis. If you all don't know your history, go look up yeah. who John Lewis was. But he was the guy who called the shots, literally, to line basically uh, armed brinks security people up on lines and tell them if they go onto the picket line, shoot them down. That's the early history of the Gates family. The father was uh, a, a henchman of Margaret Sanger in the establishment of Planned Parenthood. Yes, so you, the apple right doesn't now. fall far from the tree, does it? Yeah. Look, my father told me this many you know what what they called the good old boy network yeah. in Texas, those Freemason Lodge networks. I mean, uh, there are a lot of things like uh, you know uh, the connection b between uh, you know the Baptist Church, and I'm not criticizing the average Baptist doesn't know the connection between the the, the Freemason lodges and the Baptist Church. But I but, but I read somewhere a few years ago that. You know, like you know, fifty percent of all Baptist ministers are Freemasons. Um, yeah. Freemasons. Yeah, yeah. And my family, uh, the Halfords, were were Baptists. You know, they were abolitionists. I mean, there's some good things about them. You understand? They were they you know, they didn't have they didn't own slaves and slave plantations. Well, and then on the other <laughs> side of that, you you, you you know, you had this deep incursion into the South. I mean, you go all the whole way back to the Civil War, you know, and, and I had C.T. Wilcox on years ago, we talked about this, about, you know, how they set things up. So on one side, the Baptists and the Freemasons, you have the abolitionists, and then you have the Jesuits who come in and basically set up the Ku Klux Klan. And that whole Civil War thing was really the first shot across the bow to take down the republic and install what is effectively a, you know, a quasi-socialist, non-federalist corporatism, a type of government that, that could benefit uh, the type of corporate interests that now, now are coming. If you look today in today's news and you see what they are doing inside the White House of bringing in the heaviest hitters in the tech industry to aid Donald Trump in what is effectively a campaign to um, radically revise the government along the lines of tech companies. This is an actual article I posted it on to Facebook today. And what they've done is they've supplanted the great visions that were the democracy or the socialist state that came into full force during the Depression and FDR. And now we're heading into a form of fascism that they've now redubbed uh, neoliberalism. And that's where we are right now. Yeah, we're right at the, the, the cusp, of the turning point for whatever they have planned for us now, the more totalitarian version of whatever they have planned. And they've used the COVID as a cover. And and see, that the COVID yeah, absolutely. Crazy. And see, people don't want to hear this because... There's this desperate cry in this country for somebody to liberate. Look, people know, they know, the man on the street knows that the system is completely screwed, that they're screwed. They just can't decide on who can fix it. And the truth of the matter is that nobody can fix it because people have blindly followed all these leaders that they've sold us. 
And so if I talk about Donald Trump, and it's not that I'm a Democrat and I want to see Biden elected, because I don't, and I didn't want to see Hillary Clinton elected. But when I was on radio in 2016, and I said, you need to look very deeply at who Donald Trump is and where his connections are, because Donald Trump's connections go very deeply back into Europe, too. And in fact, his connections at some levels go back to the P2 Lodge because of the people he's done business with, which is yeah. largely the mafia. And nobody wants to hear that. Look, if, you, if you've read, you know, which was a seminal book early in my life, uh, 30 years ago, I met a man named Joseph Farrell. I'm sure you know who he is. You know, Joseph Farrell, who is. Uh, do you know who Joseph Farrell is? Yes, I'm sure everybody in this audience knows who Joseph Farrell is. I've interviewed him before, too. Yes. Yes, well, I met him 30 years ago to one of the many random things that happened in my life, the seemingly random events. I met Joseph Farrell. In fact, there's a character in my first book, Visionary, that's based on my encounter with Joseph Farrell. And Joseph Farrell, uh, the very first time I, I, I went to speak to him when he was a professor of dogmatics at a Russian Orthodox seminary in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I, I talked to him all night. He had all kinds of computer, I mean, uh, you know, computer files and and books and congressional documents and his, in the apartment he was living there while he was teaching there. And he told me that, you know, he quizzed me using the Socratic method, and he told me that uh, I didn't know enough for him to even explain to me what was going on. And he asked me to go and somehow locate a copy of Carol Quickly's book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Times. And, uh, you know, I finally was able, through great effort, to find a copy of that book, even though it had been, was banned for sale. Yeah, it was not an easy book to find back in that time. And, and I read the whole book cover to cover, and quickly, who was Bill Clinton's mentor, who he mentioned in his uh, acceptance speech for the Democratic Party nomination as his mentor from Georgetown University, quickly says in that book that there's really only one political party with two, two wings. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that the roundtable groups, uh, but, you know, the Cecil Rhodes and the roundtable and the Royal Institute of International Lord Milner, yeah. yeah. They were, uh, you know, the behind the scenes controlling everything. They were the puppeteers behind the scenes. And that no matter who you put in power, the agenda goes forward. You know, they vote one out of office and one in the office and they rotate them, but it... Basically, he said the same agenda goes forward. Yeah, yeah Trump was an anomaly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and, and listen, uh, it's interesting you met Farrell in Scranton, Pennsylvania. There is a whole backstory to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Some of our, some of our listeners will know this because of a show that I did, I think, earlier this year with Emily Moyer. Yeah. And um, we talked about uh, the connections with Scranton, Pennsylvania as well. That's an, that's a very big stronghold there of, you know, you, that, that was a Russian Orthodox seminary, which yeah. was basically an enclave of the white Russians, as you've, yeah. you've talked about here in what is effectively my backyard. See, that was, uh, you know, I, I was a, for one semester at a sister seminary in my, my hyper theological days at that point. You know, I discovered uh, the Eastern churches largely by accident. I ended up uh, engaged to a woman whose grandmother was deeply religious and. Um, and the engagement, you know, broke off, and the, and then I met my wife, and then we got married, and I was to I converted to the Greek Church first, and then I ended up in the Russian Church in Texas, and and unbeknownst to me that the Russians I in, were involved with, you know, you know, in this in the in in, in the eighties were 
many of the people that were involved with Oswald in the in the sixties, you know. And <laughs> you, just, you can't make this up, really. It's it's unbelievable. Yeah. And my father was very upset about it at the time when um, my wife and I got married in a Russian church, and uh, and uh, my parents were my father who had a top secret security clearance at the time. I, I didn't know what he was doing. He was. Uh, you know, he had worked for the Defense Advanced Research uh, uh, Projects Agency, DARPA, who set up the Internet, I think. The ARPANET came from them. Yep, exactly. I, he, yeah, I remember when I was about 13 or 14 years old, he, he took me to the DARPA uh, building uh, at Kelly Air Force Base in San Antonio and sort of walked me around for a tour of it. In the 80s, in 1980, uh, when I was at Rice, uh, he showed up one day. They, my parents moved to, to to Conroy, north of Houston, and my dad got a you know, was was working at a uh, top secret NORAD radar station, you know, in between uh, Houston and Galveston. And he came up one day and he took me out to uh, to introduce me to the people at the at the NORAD facility. And this was about the time that I had written a letter to Carter about the Iran hostage crisis, if you remember, when they had he had tried to rescue. And I wrote Carter a letter basically telling him that I didn't think he we should bomb Iran or invade Iran after the revolution. And to my surprise, six weeks after I mailed the letter to the president, kind of on a whim, I got a letter back from an undersecretary of state saying that my that the president had forwarded my letter to every department head, you know, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, and that he had been given the, the task to respond to my letter. And then my mother, after I went back in September to Rice, said that she got a, a, a weird phone call from the uh, – from a woman claiming to be President Carter's secretary and that the president had left a memo to call me to see if the State Department had answered my letter. And I remember I confronted my father at the time, who refused to tell me anything that he was dead. Why would they be answering my letter? And the, the only answer my father would give me, Randy, was that, well, but son, that's because you don't know who you are. That event, by the way, that whole um, Iran hostage situation was the origin of what we now call the October Surprise. That was that was that was the big one. That was what effectively that was that was the play against Carter to make him look weak. And ultimately, what uh, they released them right after Reagan took office. Was it after he took office or after he was elected? It yeah, was. but if you understand, if you've read anything, I mean, there's a, 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 a film called JFK2 by John Hankey. I mean, it's hard to find these things on YouTube anymore. It used to be, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could find these videos. Uh, he basically lays out all of the interconnections in Skull and Bones in that movie, kind of a follow-up to the JFK movie. The Bush family connections to all of those people. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, ironically, you know, I started getting into this genealogical stuff, you know, about a year and a half ago, trying to figure out who my family, what my antecedents were. And I came across uh, that I'm, in fact, related to the Bush family. That Barbara Bush, uh, who, who was a Pierce, you know, from the Pierce family. Mm -hmm. She uh, was, the, yes. The Which goes family. back to, you know. Goes back to, we have a common ancestor. Well, we had a Bush. president named Pierce. Two, uh, Benjamin Franklin Pierce, or ben, ben, uh, Franklin Pierce, and... They were kind of like the kind of like the Roosevelts, um, they, and the Adams. They you no, know, there was there was a Pierce, a Franklin Pierce, and then uh, his grandson was also president. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the America's the, the, we're deluded. We think that we are above these these nobility layers in this country when we're steeped in them. You know, it was I, the funny thing is that when Thomas Halford came to the New World in 1635, the Halford line di died out. There were no more heirs. Aside from this uh, Rob House, you know, lead singer of Judas Priest, and a handful of other Halfords spelled with an A, as opposed to Holford, I don't know when the... Uh, that Franklin Pierce's secretary was a Halford, a Elijah Halford from Dor uh, Dorchester, or you know, one of the, the one of the rural, rural um, English counties. So these families, I look, I looked through all the entire genealogy of my mother, and my father's family, and I'm related to the Powells from two directions, from my mother and my father. And, you know, that's why, they, you know, there are all these genetic diseases that run in the family, like severe pancreas problems, my mother. And, and Because these families were notorious about inbreeding. That's why when I brought my Hispanic wife home to meet my mother, they, they, went, they went to the roof. How could something like this happen? Because, you know, these families would marry first cousins to first cousins before they would marry outside the bloodline. It's ridiculous if you think about it, but, that, but that's the way they think. It's like the Gores and the Rothschilds are intermarried, you know? Yeah. They're very... And you can go back to the, you know, uh, to David Icke and the lizards and wondering, you know, what is the connection? What is the DNA connection to all of this, you know? I mean, look, you know, on one level, Ike wasn't wrong. But unfortunately, people don't understand that he was telling them sort of a fable. The yeah. shape-shifting lizard thing was cover. It was code for exactly what is shaken with, with human beings on this world and our own connections to beings that have basically sat in the background for probably tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand years in the history of humanity. And yeah. so, you know, I look at what I did and it was coded. The equivalent of a priesthood, a bloodline priesthood, like uh, in many religions, this priesthood of this uh, esoteric kind of Freemason style religion. Rosicrucianism, Sir Francis Bacon. I read all of this stuff. I've somehow I was brought in to read this stuff. You understand, to be exposed to this, to meet the people like Joseph Farrell and others. To somehow end up on the internet, uh, you know, talking to Visigoth. It seemed very in retrospect, looking back on all of it, it just, it, it, it's very strange, you know? Well, it's not strange, I, that, because there's this frequency that goes through us in humanity. And I mean, you have a much better sense of where you came from in terms of your bloodline. I don't. I can only go back a few generations to my own family and what their connections were and some of the things that I've sorted through in terms of my own childhood and the, the experiences that I've had. But there is this frequency of truth that is inside of us that is, it's like a beacon. And it like, you know, at some point you'll meet somebody that's a catalyst for awakening. You met Joseph P. Farrell, you know, yeah. which is not a small deal. I, I, I don't always appreciate some of the things that, that Joseph says and does, but his scholarship's impeccable. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of his theses, but I've talked to him enough over the years and, and, and have known him for long enough to know that I think he's sincere in what he does. And, and he's truly a man who, you know, he's not wealthy, 
Um, he makes his living literally writing his books, and he lives pretty humbly, frankly. And he's also had to have, be very circumspect and move a lot because of his security. I mean, it's it's obvious that there are people who tap into this at different levels, and there are catalysts for truth. And, you know, for listeners out there, you know, this is where you have to be careful because the messenger thing works both ways. There's people that will come, and especially now with the Internet, the, the deception is so hot um, that you really have to tune your discernment. But it's, you know, your, your awakening is kind of, kind of in line with, you know, somebody who was on this trajectory for a long time, and then you had that, that grand flash that happened. You know, what's really odd is that we lived in Flushing, uh, in Queens, for a very long time. I, I left the seminary that I could do. We stayed in New York because my wife had a job, and one one having a job was better than the, us going back to Texas with no jobs. And uh, through a trajectory, we ended up buying a house. Um, after we both, you know, she went back to work after the children were born, and after she, the, you know, they reached school age, and she was able to go back to work as a teacher, and we ended up, in of all places, Beth Page, New York, Farmingdale, around, mm -hmm. which of course were the old Powell family lands. You understand? I ended up on a house near a tree, where my pal ancestors would have been living. And there's a whole story about my family, about how the pal, my branch went from uh, Beth Page to, uh, to North Carolina, and then to Union, South Carolina, and then from Union, South Carolina, they branched off some to Tennessee, some to Kentucky, some uh, uh, and then they then they ended up in Missouri in the 1840s, and then and then in Texas after the Republic came. And there, there's been I've made this whole circular journey back to where it all began. You understand, unbeknownst, it's like you know a homing pigeon coming back home. It's mm -hmm. like my DNA mm -hmm. yeah. you know, brought me back, and you know to where the first. The, you know, the, back to the uh, family environs from the 1600s. Yeah. It's just strange. I mean, you know, why we bought that house? We had looked at 50 houses all over Long Island, and we chose that house, that plot of land. It, it's just strange, as I said. So we're uh, we're doing this show in two segments, and um, we're bumping up on the first hour. And I want people, because this segment will go out on YouTube, I want you to bring us up to speed on what you're doing with your writing projects and um, some of your titles, some of your projects, and, and maybe where people can find those books. Well, you know, I, I write under a pseudonym, Michael Halford, or Halford, H-A-L-L-F-O-R-D. If you type it in Amazon, I think you can find the four of the books. It's not so easy to find books on Amazon, no. even with the writer's name. The first book in the series is Visionary. Visionary. The second book is called The Omega Conspiracy. Uh, that's, you know, it touches... And I write interlocked, you know, sometimes complicated stories, but it's basically about the awakening, the perception of who we are. You know, I, I use uh, you know, the first book, and, and, and I had one of my first interviews about the book back in 2008, remember, on one of your programs on the threshing floor. Yeah, 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 you did. And you, in fact, I, I, in fact, I think the description that is now... That was visionary. Uh, that was when you put the visionary book it. out. Yep. And after the Omega Conspiracy uh, was the, uh, the uh, was the book version of my the screenplay I wrote back in 2002 called Prodigy, 
which I unfortunately had when the death of my granddaughter back in 2009, which I was on the, uh, one of your programs. Oh, yeah. Well, I've, we talked about this. Yeah. Several times about the death of my granddaughter from brain cancer. Yeah. Uh, I gave a copy of the visionary book to uh, a social worker who claimed he knew this guy, Tim Cream, and uh, who was doing the Hero Show at the time. And three years later, uh, my screenplay and my book, in, uh, uh, you know, I uh, there was a TV show called Touch, yep, uh, which ended up on uh, on Fox uh, TV, and I sued Fox back in 2012 um, for copyright infringement, and of course I learned it's it, it virtually impossible to win in a copyright uh, lawsuit in the United States if you're a private individual. And the case was dismissed without prejudice on a pretrial motion, and that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah. We outlined that in a show that you and I did on April 13th of 2012. It's called A Touch of Theft. And that show goes into the whole Tim Kring touch situation and your lawsuit and you know the show which which starred Kiefer Sutherland and and because at that time the visionary book um, was basically the template for this we we, we penetrated with the show we actually were in touch with some other people who were experiencing similar issues of intellectual theft by uh, Tim Crane. Well, I actually met the, uh, not met, but had conversations with uh, the two prior people who had sued Tim Crane yeah. for claiming that he had stolen the hero show from yeah. him. Yeah. And so, and and I also had a correspondence with this uh, physicist from uh, the University of London that knew David Bohm, uh, the physicist who I uh, referenced David Bohm in the screenplay and later in the book I wrote, uh, you know, expansion of the screenplay called Prodigy. That was the title of my uh, my story about a, this autistic boy with magic powers who was trying to fix the world, which is basically the premise. If you go on Hulu and look up Touch, it's the same premise, many of the same uh, characteristics. There were over 350 similarities that we filed in our summons and complaint, and the judge ruled that these were all random scattershot similarities. And that you know, that at one point he even wrote in his order that uh, the reason why they were similar was because the only way you could write a story about an autistic boy was the way that the Touch program was written. The Kring. Uh, and then Kring read it independently, even though I had given the... Uh, the yeah, and then to inform this conversation a little bit, it should be noted here that Ev's youngest son is autistic. Yes. And, and that's, so the background writing for this in the character and what is, you know, sort of believable in dealing with autistic children came from a real world aspect uh, from your own life and I, I was just looking back on this because when we when we did this show I put some of the links in here and that writer's name was Jason Wild and that was the case mm -hmm. that he brought against Tim Kring for death of for um, for uh, for the last season of Heroes yeah Jason yeah for Wild. Heroes and he's still one of my Facebook friends I still get information so many well, what's interesting and... is all these links are bleached every one of them are gone off the internet you know we were talking at the beginning of the show about the fact that so much data disappears they now disappear data in cycles of a few hours and this is this is the gaslighting that we're seeing right now you know maybe we just top this in this side of the the talk off with the fact that what one at one time took 15 years from the inception of the open internet to the advent of the web and, and, and internet 2.0. It, it took them a long time to bleach a lot of those documents out of the internet. The latency on the internet is 
pretty considerable because of the way servers work. They now have the ability to post news, unpost news, rewrite news in real time right before your very eyes. They do that a lot. They're doing it continuously with COVID. I've watched data that I have pursued because every day I pull up more data. And I watch now as they put the data out, then they put conflicting data out, then they negate the conflicting data, and they revise the first data and they put that out. This is gaslighting. If you do this to somebody in real life on a continuous basis, this is the type of abuse that drives a person into psychosis. I know. Well, this is the uh, this, uh, this is the kind of thing, and this is the, the storylines of what I've been working on recently about a man who uh, begins to notice. You know, we, his intention is heightened, but he begins to notice that everything is subtly changing every day. Mm, but the information that yeah. is out there, yes. you know, streams, yes. streams. Yeah. Yes, we're being digitally gaslighted 24-7. So I'm, what we're going to do, uh, and again, um, uh, the links for Ev's books will be with this show wherever you find it. If you are on my Patreon group, that'll be in the, um, in the page notes, the show notes. And on YouTube, you'll just look down in the description box and the links will be there. You can go on to Amazon. These books are, these books are, these, these are readers' delights. Uh, they're big books. They're big ideas. They're big concepts. Not for the faint of heart. You folks need to read more. And um, this, is, this is big stuff. So we're going to cross over onto the other side for the, for the patrons. This will be the... Um, the to dive into the deep like we haven't been diving deep in this hour and I want to thank you Ev for joining us for this segment and uh, that's going to wrap it for this side if you'd like to join us it is patreon.com forward slash Randy Moggins that's the home of the material that I'm putting out for the eye of the needle and the off planet radio shows which continue with interviews like this the truth is out there it's inside you um, really going to have to look for it because it'll be gone in like two nanoseconds. See you on the other Are side. Movement, Randy? This is Off Planet Radio.